Well, guys, welcome uh, to church again. Uh, if, if this is your first time here, uh, my name is Todd Peterson. I'm the lead pastor here at the church, and happy Easter to you. And uh, and, and today we're going to uh, we're going to get into an interesting uh, little conversation. And if you haven't been coming to our church for the the people who have regularly been coming for the past couple of years, we've been going through the Old Testament together. And we've been going through like story after story and just kind of following along with what the Old Testament has said. But I'm going to be honest with you. We've had a lot of people that are like, Todd, I'm tired of the Old Testament. Right? How come we can't talk about the New Testament? When's the New Testament coming? And I think that the reason why so many of us are frustrated is because the Bible can sometimes seem a little confusing. And so the question that I want us to ask today is, as we... we uh, look into the story of Easter is why is the Bible so confusing? Because let's be honest, when you go through the Old Testament, it seems like this collection of just random stories that have absolutely nothing to do with one another. And so why is the Bible so confusing? In fact, some of you in here today have, uh, have actually tried reading the Bible for yourself. Has anybody ever tried to read the Bible and then you get frustrated and you stop? Right? Doesn't that happen to so many of us? It, why? You get frustrated because it can be confusing. Why is the Bible so confusing? And think about it. For, if God loves us, and if God wants to communicate to us through the Bible, why did He make it so confusing? And, and for those of you who, uh, maybe this is your first time in, in church, um, perhaps you're like what we like to call in the church world the CEOs of church. Okay, that's the Christmas and Easter only, right? So maybe you're a Christian, a Christmas and Easter only type of person. And you know what? I have a lot of respect for you. If you're a, a, a Christmas and Easter only, you, you probably don't have a lot, whole lot of time in your life, and you've got okay. I need to know the basics of Christianity, and you basically got it down, right? You come on Christmas. To find out that Jesus was born of a virgin and in a manger. You come on Easter, Jesus died on a cross for my sins. All you got to remember is to be a good person on top of that. You pretty much got Christianity licked, right? Like, why do I have to keep coming after I got the basic story down? But here's the question. Is there more? And are you missing out? Because maybe the Bible is confusing. And so uh, today, in order to answer that question, we're going to come to, uh, I, I actually have a hard time because every, every Easter there's like different things that you can talk about with the Easter story. But I always come back to this story in uh, Luke chapter 24 about the disciples that are on the road to Emmaus. And that's mm -hmm. what I want to talk about today. Now, let me kind of catch you up to where we are in the story. Jesus has already been crucified. He died on a cross. He was buried in a tomb. And now it's three days later. Now in the morning, that same morning, uh, Mary and a few of her friends went to go dress uh, Jesus' body. They would put perfumes and spices on the body. Uh, she couldn't get in there beforehand because it was Passover. And so finally, Passover is, is finished. And so she can actually go in there and, and anoint Jesus' body. But when she gets to the tomb, there's no body. And then on top of that, they turn around and there's angels there. And angels spoke to them saying that Jesus is alive. But at this point, they haven't seen Jesus alive. So they run back and they tell the disciples. John and Peter run back to, to the temple. Sure enough, Jesus' body is missing, but there's no angels and there's no Jesus. And so uh, that's kind of where we pick up our story. In Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 13. It says, That very day, two of them, two of the people who followed Jesus, these are not two of the original twelve disciples. There were actually other disciples that were following Jesus. So these are, uh, that very day, there was two of these disciples were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. So let me give you kind of the big seven miles to walk in a day is really not that big of a deal, especially if you're used to walking everywhere. Probably for those of us who drive everywhere, it'd be exhausting, right? But for them, that was just kind of normal. And they're going from Jerusalem 
And so everywhere from Jerusalem was downhill, so it was a lot easier. So they're just kind of taking this stroll, right? And, and as they were walking, verse 14, they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. So all the events that had happened, they were talking about it. This is where the story gets interesting. Verse, verse 15. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But here's where it gets interesting. Verse 16. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Now we don't know why they didn't recognize Jesus. Remember back then, they didn't have pictures of people. And, and so if they weren't immediate disciples, maybe they had seen him from a distance. You know, I don't know, maybe the sun was really bright that day and they couldn't really make out his face. Maybe maybe he had a cloak on. Or maybe Jesus just did one of those like Jedi mind tricks, like these are not the droids that you're looking for type of thing, you know. I don't know what, what, what happened, but here's, here's what's cool. It makes for a really interesting story. Like they're talking to Jesus and they don't realize it's Jesus. It's kind of like uh, in... Uh, uh, Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade. Remember when when they're looking over the cliff because they thought he fell off the cliff, and then he like stands like right behind him, and they're like, "Oh, he's so wonderful," <laughs> you know, and he's just standing right there. Same kind of thing. So interesting story, right? So they're walking, and they don't realize that the stranger is Jesus, but it's Jesus, and so Jesus kind of becomes a little bit of a drama queen in this story because he realizes they don't they don't understand, and so he kind of plays along. He plays the part. Verse 17, and Jesus said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding uh, with each other as you walk? And they stopped walking. They stood still. And they were looking sad. Verse 18, then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? But what have you been, living under a rock? You didn't... You don't know what's been going on. We, we thought we had the Messiah. Then Jesus continuing to play the part, verse 19, and Jesus said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet. Notice how they still call him a prophet. Mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Verse 20, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and they crucified him. Man, we thought he was something special. And so in some ways, they were upset with their own religious leaders for crucifying him, but they were also kind of upset with Jesus because it was like, we thought you were really important. Verse 21, they said, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We thought that he might be the Messiah, not just a prophet. But we thought maybe he was the Messiah, the one that was promised to deliver us from this great evil. And they were thinking from the evil of, of uh, Roman oppression. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. Verse 22, Moreover, some, uh, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. Verse 23, And when they did not find his body, they came back, saying that they had, uh, that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And so we've been kind of down, and then this morning we had this hope. So in verse 24, some of those who were with us went to the tomb, that would be Peter and John, and they found it just as the women had said, but him they didn't see. So we had hope in this Jesus, and then he was, he was crucified, and then we had hope this morning that he might be alive, but... Now nobody can find him. And then in verse 25, Jesus says to them, O foolish ones, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Why? What do you mean? Verse 26, Was it not necessary that the Christ, okay, Christ is in Greek, it's the same word as Messiah in Hebrew, wasn't it necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? What? What are you talking about? Verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. 
You know what Moses and all the prophet means? That's kind of their way of saying the Old Testament. It wasn't called the Old Testament back then. But Moses is the first five books of the Bible. Prophets is, is the rest of the Old Testament. Now the thing, I love this story, but the thing that frustrates me about this story is they didn't say what Jesus talked about. Like what part of, what parts of the Old Testament did he did he talk about? Maybe he talked about Abraham and Isaac. Do you guys, for those of you who are in my church, you guys remember that story, Abraham and Isaac? Remember, um, Abraham and Sarah were really, really old and they thought that they would never have a kid and it was a miracle that they had Isaac. And Abraham loved Isaac. And all of a sudden, this random part of the story, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, God's like, hey, I want you to sacrifice your son to me. And so Abraham is hurt, but... He wanted to show God that he, he loved him. And so he takes his son. And it's this heart-wrenching story of how he takes his son, makes his son carry the wood. They travel up on top of the mountain. He ties up his son. He arranges the wood. Places his son on top of the wood. Because what they would do is they would sacrifice the animal and then they, it would be a burnt offering. And so he ties up his son. He takes the knife. And just as he's about to plunge it into his son, God holds his hand. He says, Abraham, now I know how committed you are to me. And in that moment, God provided another sacrifice. A substitutionary sacrifice. It was a, a ram that its horns got, had gotten caught in the thicket. And so Abraham sacrificed that ram instead of his son. I wonder if Jesus pointed to that story and said, hey, that story was really about this guy Jesus of Nazareth. How so? Well, because God sent his only son to be a substitutionary sacrifice for us so that we could have a relationship with God. Just, just like his son carried the wood, Jesus carried his own cross. I mean, it's undeniable. I mean, that story in the Old Testament is about Jesus. I wonder if Jesus told them that story. Or, or maybe the story about Jacob's ladder. For those of you who are, in, who are in my church, you guys remember the story of Jacob's ladder? Jacob was, was ostracized from his family. His brother was trying to kill him. He's running. He's in the middle of nowhere. He's all alone at Bethel. And in the middle of the night, he has this dream. And in the dream, he sees a ladder that goes from where he's at all the way up into heaven. And, and God the Father is up at the top of the, the, the ladder. And angels are coming up and down on the ladder. And it was this dream that was basically God saying, you have access to me. Did you know that Jesus actually used that same thing in the New Testament? And he told Nathaniel in the book of John, he said, I am that ladder. And through me, you have access to, to the Father. You have access to heaven. Later on, Jesus would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. Because I am Jacob's ladder. I wonder if he told them the story of Joseph. Remember how Joseph was betrayed by his own brothers and he was sold into slavery? But, but by an interesting twist of fate, he became a very powerful man. And he had every right to kill his brothers for what they had done to him. But instead, he forgave them and then saved them from a famine that should have killed their, uh, taken their lives and the, and the lives of their families. In the same way, we've all betrayed Jesus. We, we have all sinned against God, just as Joseph's brothers have sinned against him. But because Jesus has forgiven us, we can spend. We have been saved from an eternity separated from God. I wonder if Jesus told them the story of Moses and the Passover lamb. You guys know that story. That they, they were in Egypt and they were enslaved in Egypt. Do you remember? Let my people go. Remember that whole thing. That that was what he would say to Pharaoh. Let my people go. And Pharaoh would say no. And then there would be a plague that would come. 
And this happened over and over and over again until the last plague. And the last plague was, God said, my angel of death is coming to visit Egypt. And out of every household, he is going to take the life of the eldest son. Unless, and this is what he told the Jewish people, the, the nation of Israel. Unless you sacrifice a lamb and you take the blood and you put the blood of the lamb on the, on, on the posts of your door. And if you do that, then you'll be covered by the blood. And anybody who's covered by the blood of the Lamb, the angel of death will pass over you. How interesting. And maybe the disciples didn't realize the, the irony that Jesus was actually sacrificed on Passover. And in the same way, if you are covered by the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, then you, the angel of death, will pass over you and you will have eternal life with Him. I wonder if he reminded them of the story of also Moses with, with the snakes. You guys remember the snakes in the wilderness? The people were rebellious against God and so he allowed poisonous snakes and an infestation of, of poisonous snakes and people were getting bit and they were dying and the people cried out to God and so God went to Moses and he says, Moses, what I want you to do is take this pole and put a, 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 a brass snake on top of it. And put it on a high place and, 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 and lift it up. And then anybody who gets bit by the snake, if they look upon that snake, they will not die because of the venom. In the New Testament, Jesus said, just as they lifted up that snake, so will they lift me up in crucifixion. And anyone who looks upon me will not die from the venom of their own sin. I wonder if he told him the story of David and Goliath. And you know, a lot of us, we, we want to read the story of David and Goliath. We want to think of ourselves as David, overcoming some big you know, obstacle in our life. Do you know what the truth about that story is? We're not David. We're the helpless Israelite army, scared, and we don't know what to do. We're powerless. And all of a sudden, Jesus, who is David, comes and destroys this giant of sin and death so that we can be victorious. Church, you remember the story of Elisha? He was this really powerful prophet in the Old Testament that, that he had all this power, but then he was surrounded by an enemy army and it was just him and his servant. And you remember when, when the servant comes out and says, what are we going to do? And Elisha says this really weird thing. He goes, don't worry, there's more with us than are against us. And the servant's freaking out. What do you mean there's more with us? It's just you and me and there's a whole army. And God doesn't, he doesn't pray to God and say, God, will you save us? Elisha prays to God and says, would you open his eyes? And all of a sudden the servant's eyes are open and he sees that they are surrounded by chariots of fire. There's a whole spiritual army ready to pounce. I wonder if Jesus reminded them on the night that he was arrested that Peter turned around with a sword and chopped off the ear of a servant and, and, and Jesus stopped everything. He took the ear, put it back, healed the man's ear and then he turned to Peter and he says, Don't you think that I could call down 12 legions of angels? No. Because this is what I came here to do. Just in case these two disciples thought that Jesus was a victim. No, Jesus willingly went. He had options. And he chose the cross. We spent a lot of time talking about the temple. Remember we've talked about the Holy of Holies, where the presence of God is. And it was separated. People couldn't go into the Holy of Holies. If you went in there, you would die. And you were separated from the Holy of Holies... By this, by this thick curtain. And only once a year could the high priest who had to cleanse himself would go in there and he would offer a, an atonement sacrifice for the sins of all the people. And I wonder if that day when he was talking to the disciples, did he not remind them that in the... And we have this in the, in the book of Matthew. 
that the, the temple curtain, that thick temple curtain, was ripped in two. But here's the interesting thing. It was ripped from the top to the bottom. Meaning that God has now torn away the barriers between us and Him. We have direct access to God through Jesus Christ. Finally, I'm sure... <laughs> Finally, I'm sure that in Isaiah 53, God, Jesus read to them that. Isaiah 53 was actually uh, written hundreds of years before Christ. This was a, a prophecy. And so, I want to read this to you. I'm sure that Jesus quoted them this. Isaiah 53, verse 5. Hundreds of years before... But he was pierced for our transgressions. And he was crushed for our iniquities. Transgressions and, and iniquities are just a fancy way of saying sin. He was pierced for our sin. And you know what's interesting? This was written before crucifixion was even a thing. It had not even be, been invented yet. Hundreds of years before Jesus. But he was pierced for our sin. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Verse 6. Is not this our story? All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord, or Yahweh, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. God has taken our sin and placed it on the suffering Messiah. Verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like sheep that are before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Do you remember? Do you remember the story of Jesus on, on his trial? And he didn't even open his mouth to try to defend himself. Verse 9. And they made his grave with the wicked. That means that Jesus died with the wicked. You guys remember the story? He was crucified. And crucifixion was, was saved for those who uh, were rapists and murderers. And he was actually uh, crucified in between two other bad guys. So they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Do you remember that after they crucified him? Joseph of Arimathea asked for his body and buried him in a rich man's tomb. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Hundreds of years before Jesus. And you could even say, well, maybe Jesus knew about this and so then at his trial he didn't say anything. Yeah, but how would he have had them crucify him and then have him buried with a rich man? How is that even possible? And so I, I still wonder to this day, what were the stories that Jesus told them? But back, back to Luke chapter 24, verse 28. Let's continue the story. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. And here's Jesus being a drama queen again. He acted as if he were going further. But then they urged him in verse 29 strongly saying, stay with us, for it is towards evening and the day is, is now far spent. They wanted to spend more time with this stranger. So he went in to stay with them. Verse 30, And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and he blessed it. And he broke it and he gave it to them. And there was something in the way that he broke the bread that all of a sudden they go, wait! I know who that is. Verse 31, and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. But then he vanished from their sight. And here's the key verse. And they said to each other, of course, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Did not our hearts burn inside of us when he was making those connections? Church, as I was making those connections for you, was your heart not burning inside of you when we were learning about how those Old Testament stories all pointed to Jesus Christ? 
Verse 33, and they rose at that same hour. It was late and it was dangerous to go at night, but they didn't care. And they returned to, to Jerusalem and they found the eleven, the, the original disciples, and those who were with them gathered together. Verse 34, saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Verse 25, and they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. And by the way, the story goes on that while they were sitting there saying that to them, Jesus then appears to those 11 disciples in the room. So why bring all this up? <clears throat> You know, what's interesting is the Bible was even confusing to the people back then. But when Jesus was talking to them and explaining the scriptures and how it all pointed to the cross, all of a sudden, their hearts were burning inside of them. And the lesson that we learn from this story is that the Bible comes into focus at the cross. Let me say that again. The Bible comes into focus... At the cross. And so, so many people from my church, I, I know, listen, we're going to get to the New Testament soon, I promise, Tammy, okay? So stop asking me. But do you see now that the Bible comes into focus at the cross because everything points to Jesus? What's crazy about Scripture, right, is that whether it was before Jesus or written after Jesus, it all points to the cross. Even Jesus coming again points to the cross. For those of you who have ever tried to read the Bible and you got frustrated and you stopped because it was so confusing. You know, I actually want to... Um, Chuck actually said something to me last week. By the way, nice haircut, Chuck. Look good. Chuck actually came up to me last week and he said, you know... The Pulse of Miami Church has this huge blessing in that he says, I've never seen so many people that are so that, that understand scripture the way that the people at the Pulse do. He says, you've got so many people here that really understand scripture. He goes, I've been in, in a lot of churches. In fact, I've been in a lot of bigger churches where they didn't have this many people that truly understood scripture. And so if you're here today, here's what I want to encourage you. If you've ever thought, you know what, I'd like to be able to read the Bible and understand it. Get to know some people in this church, they'll help you. And what they'll show you how to do is when it gets confusing, if you just look at the cross, all of a sudden, the Bible comes into focus at the cross. And finally, maybe you're here today and you don't typically come to church, but it's Easter Sunday. Maybe you're a Christmas and Easter only. I'm really happy that you're here, by the way. And I do think that you're a smart person for going, you know what, I got the basics of Christianity. But could, could I just say that I think you might be missing out on something? <laughs> There's a reason why the people in our church come every Sunday, typically. Majority of us come every Sunday unless there's something crazy happening, like we're like traveling through Italy or something. <laughs> right? Did you guys have a good time? Yeah. You went to the Vatican though. So that's it. It was like we, we went to church. We went to the Vatican. <laughs> <laughs> but you know why people come here every week? Whether you guys realize it or not, it's because when we open scripture together, don't you feel a burning inside of your heart? And for those of you who don't come to church on a regular basis, let me tell you something. If you've never experienced Scripture and that burning in your heart, man, you're missing out on some of the best parts of Christianity. The Bible comes into focus at the cross. Let's read our memorization verse together. We do this every week in our church. Luke chapter 11, verse 28. Read it out loud with me. He replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. The reason why there's people who come to this church every week is because they heard the word of God and they obeyed it and God blessed their life. And here's what I want to tell you. God wants to bless your life too. But here's the question. Will you hear the word of God and will you obey it?
Let me have everyone bow their heads, close their eyes. Maybe you're here today and you are a believer, you are a Christian, you've already said yes to Jesus Christ as your Savior. But you're realizing, you know what, I think I'm missing out on something. Would you just make a commitment and say to God, you know what, God, I'm either going to read my Bible or I'm going to attend a church. You don't have to come to this church. But I want to experience what it's like to have God's Word burn in my heart. But maybe you're here today and maybe you're not sure if you're a Christian. You think you are. Maybe your parents were. Maybe you grew up in church. Maybe you didn't. Here's what I'm going to tell you. If there's never been a point in your life where you said yes to Jesus Christ as your Savior, you probably aren't. But here's what I want to do. I don't want anybody to leave here without the opportunity to become a believer in Jesus Christ today. To say yes to Jesus. But before I give you that opportunity, let me explain what that opportunity means. Saying yes to Jesus means understanding that God is perfect and God is holy. But you and I, we are not perfect and we are not holy. And our imperfection and our unholiness is what the Bible calls sin. And sin separates us from a perfect and holy God. In fact, our sin violates the very nature of who God is. And because of our sin, we are hopelessly separated from Him. There's nothing that we can do to fix that. A lot of people think that they can just be good people, but here's what I'm going to tell you. There is no amount of good things that you can do to fix your sin problem. Well, I'll just go to church a lot. No, no, there's no amount of church that you can attend. There's no amount of money that you can give to charity. We are hopelessly lost. There's nothing that we can do to fix our relationship with God. But if you've missed out on everything else I've said here today, do not miss out on these next few words. But God loves you anyway. You say, but Todd, you don't know what I've done in my life. And you're right, I don't. But I know what God did. He sent His only precious child to die for you. And I'm sure that you have people in this life who love you, but there's, I, I can guarantee you this. There is nobody in this life who loves you enough to allow their precious child to die for you. That is the unbelievable and unmistakable love of God. The story goes that God sent His Son Jesus from heaven to earth. Jesus lived the perfect life that you and I are not capable of living. But at the end of His time here on earth, instead of just going back up into heaven, He laid down His life on the cross. He allowed Himself to be executed like murderers were executed. Why? So that no matter what you and I have done in this life, when we believe in Jesus, our sin is placed on that cross and Jesus' righteousness, His right relationship with God the Father is placed on us. The best part of this story is that when the only precious child of God places His identity on you, He gives you the right to become a precious child of God yourself. And so in a minute, if you're here today, the reason why every head is bowed and every eye is closed is because I'm going to ask you if you would like to say yes to Jesus, to raise your hand. Nobody's going to be looking around. I just want to know who I'm praying with. And so if you want to become a child of God, you want to say yes to Jesus today, I want you to raise your hand right now. Amen. 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 Anybody else? Amen. Amen. I want you to know something. If you raised your hand today, there's probably a person that's been praying for you. They've been praying that you would say yes to Jesus for a long time. Would you just pray with me? And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a prayer. I, I don't ask. I, don't, don't say the prayer out loud. Just repeat it in your heart. But just say, Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. But I believe in you. I believe that you came from heaven to earth. That you lived the perfect life. That you died on the cross for my sin. And that you rose three days later just to prove that you're God. Jesus, come into my life. Fill me from the inside out. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you pray to receive Jesus Christ today, I, I want you to tell somebody. 
Tell that person that maybe he's been praying for you. Hey, I, I prayed to receive Jesus today, and, and I want you to hold me accountable. I, I, I want to learn how, how my heart can burn inside of me as I listen to the Word of God. God bless you, guys.